May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I apologise if I'm going to hit the wrong notes this morning during the collect and the sursum corda and uh, the various other bits that are chanted. There's one of the fans is singing a note at me. And it's something like... Mm, mm. So my voice will sound flat, or it's flat, or it's sharp, or I'm... Sh I don't know which one is which way round, but please do forgive me. And I know some of you are very indulgent indeed and very kind when I sing incorrectly. However, when we hear this passage from St. Luke's Gospel that we've just heard this morning, one of the really hard sayings of Christ, one of those really tough sayings, very often our first inclination is to reach for Herr Pastor Dr. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's famous and wonderful book, The Cost of Discipleship, that great Lutheran pastor of the 20th century who confronted evil in its most horrendous form in Nazi Germany, and who, of course, died a martyr's death on the 9th of April, 1945, just within a few days of the... Uh, of the surrender of the Hitler regime. We often, when we come across passages like this, turn to the cost of discipleship because there Bonhoeffer has meditated long and hard on the cost of discipleship, what it means to follow in the way of Christ. And for those of you who have read the work or who may be intimately acquainted with it, as Lutherans, as I hope you are, all good Lutherans here must know the cost of discipleship off by heart. Those of you who will have read the book know how he stresses the way of the cross, and he challenges those who preach what Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace. He challenges, challenges us to follow in the way of Christ, which is an extraordinarily difficult decision and calling. Writing as Bonhoeffer did from within a context of profound evil that had taken hold not just of the German nation, but also of much of the church in Germany as well, even before Hitler began to rise to power, there was a move within Germany to embroil the church in the service of German National Socialism. In the midst of this broiling cauldron, Bonhoeffer took hold, or perhaps I should say was taken hold by, was grasped by the message of Christ of the cross and laid it out as the foundation of Christian life and discipleship. To illust illustrate the radicalness of this vision, we need only lift up and remember that one verse that I hope is burned in the memories of all of us, not just those who are Lutherans, but when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die, Bonhoeffer writes. And the more recent translations have said, whenever Christ calls us, it leads to death. Bonhoeffer here is not referring directly to the gospel reading we've heard, but you can see the connection. If you're going to follow Christ, you had better sit down and count the cost. It is worth noting that when Bonhoeffer does deal with these precise verses from St. Luke's Gospel, 
he makes the incredibly and astonishingly important point that when it comes to discipleship, he writes, we must each make the decision for ourselves. Perhaps that does not sound quite as radical as Christ's statement about hating family and hating friends in order to follow in the way of the cross. But even if it is slightly muted, there is great wisdom and depth in Bonhoeffer's reading of Christ's saying. Bonhoeffer writes, each is called individually, each must follow alone. Out of fear of such aloneness, a human being seeks safety in the people and things around them. Individual, individuals suddenly discover all their responsibilities and cling to them. Christ intends the human being to be lonely. As individuals, they should see nothing except him who calls them. Reading Christ's words in the light of Bonhoeffer's interpretation, my memory goes to Genesis chapter 2 and God's observation that it is not good for human beings to be alone. To, in, to follow Christ involves a dying yes, but perhaps loneliness is a worse reality. And yet it seems as if Christ calls us to that. We are responsible for our discipleship. One of the reasons that this is such an important passage is that it uncovers the lukewarmness with which most of us approach our faith. I include myself. Most of us are devout. Most of us say our prayers or the rosary. Most of us have sat down and have counted the cost of grace or attempted to do so. And we have concluded that we can only go quite so far. In this, I don't think any of us are alone. But I know from my many conversations with parishioners in this magnificent parish and with others beyond the bounds of our parish that we want to embrace the calling of Christ. We want to follow in Christ's way with his disciples. We wish to walk in a living, nourishing, trusting relationship with him. But there has to be a softer way of saying this, one that allows us to maintain our allegiances to family and friends. We can pledge allegiance to our nation and still our allegiance to Christ at the same time. Am I not correct? Having turned to Bonhoeffer as a touchstone for this reflection, but having just finished looking at Karl Barth's emergency homiletic, his preaching class taught in the winter of 1932 to the summer of 1933, I must mention that reformed theologians' own attempts to wrestle with these same questions. Barth faced the same forces of evil that Bonhoeffer did, faced them in the same era, in the same nation, and in a somewhat different fashion, offers a means of counteracting the force that had taken hold of the nation at that time, including taking, taking hold of much of the church's leadership, alas, and so sadly. The message that was embraced by the vast majority of Barth's colleagues across the nation, his students and his colleagues, 
was that the church stood in service to the Volk. It was the Volk and the state that would determine what the gospel message was to be. For Bart, this was simply wrong-headed, and thus he sought to help his students and colleagues listen to the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, to take comfort from the sacraments of the church, so that then they could speak a word of truth to their time. Now, we dare not compare our own time to that of 1930s Germany. But are we not faced with the same dilemmas, the same series of questions as children burn and die in Syria, as the most ancient Christian communities in the world, in Egypt and in Turkey, face persecution and extermination? Are not these the same questions that Bonhoeffer and Barth addressed themselves? What is to be our response? We do not preach party politics from this pulpit. We do not engage in that kind of diatribe. But the message that we are encouraged to give is one that is, in, that is comfortable and in line with our culture. It says, God is love, so relax. Don't do anything. And I don't know what the answer is to these issues. I do not know what the way forward can be for us. We're damned if we do, we're damned if, we're d if we don't. Jesus turns this back at us, calling on us to count the cost. Jesus points to kings who, of course, have counted the cost before they go to war. We read this and wonder what our leaders would do if they were ever to sit down and count the cost before they send our young women and our young men into harm's way. If we are to follow Christ on the road to discipleship, shouldn't we consider the cost? Are we willing to face the cost? God's grace and God's holy church, thank goodness, will always be there to help and support us as we struggle with the hard sayings of Christ. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.